بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد I'd like to begin this brief reminder with the statement of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala where he states وَهَذَا كِتَابٌ إِنْتَلْنَاهُ مُبَارَقٌ فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَهَذَا كِتَابٌ إِنْتَلْنَاهُ مُبَارَقٌ فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَاتَّبُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala he states that this is a book that we have revealed to you, blessed. So follow it. And have a taqwa in order that you may obtain mercy. In order that you may obtain mercy. Ibn al-Kathir he states concerning this particular verse, he says, لمن اتبعه وعمل به في الدنيا والآخرة لأنه حبل الله المتين. He says concerning this particular verse that in it is the call to the following of the Quran and he يعني الله تبارك وتعالى instills yani, within this verse a desire within his servants for the book, for the Qur'an. He instills a desire or a yearning for the book, for the Qur'an. He encourages this being yani, a desire as it relates to the Qur'an. And he commands them with contemplation of his verses and actions in, according, in, in accordance to it and inviting to it and he describes it with being with it being blessed for whomsoever follows it and acts by way of it in this dunya and in the next life in this dunya and in the next life. And that is because it, I mean, the Quran is the strong, mighty rope of Allah to God. There's, there's a particular statement in this ayah that a Shaykh Abdul Rahman ibn Nasir as Sa'di. Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi he focused on. And that is the statement of Allah Tabarak ta'ala, Fattabi'uhu, so follow it. After Allah Tabarak ta'ala mentioned that it was a blessed book that was sent down, he gives a command, so follow it. He states, Fima yamuru bihi wa yanha. وَابْنُوا أُصُولَ الدِّينِكُمْ وَفَرُوعَهُ عَلَيْهِ That the intent that is met here, follow it, 
as it pertains to whatsoever he commands, and as it pertains to whatsoever he prohibits, build the foundations of your religion and the subsidiary or branch issues of your religion upon it. Upon it, yani the Quran. Upon it, yani the Quran. This is a methodology for the individual that traverses upon it that will lead to success. That will lead to success. This particular point is emphasized throughout the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. And to aid in emphasizing that point, then I'd like to quote a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from a narration that is proven to be authentically attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is considered to be Mutafakun Alay. Mutafakun Alay, this term, what is intended by it for those that may not know, is that it was collected by both Imam al Bukhari and Imam Muslim fi Sahih Ain in their two authentic collections of Ahadith. This particular narration, it is upon the authority of Abu Musa al Ash'ari. Allah ta'ala alayhi. Well, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated, إِنَّمَا مَثَلِي وَمَثَلُ مَا فَعَثَّنِ اللَّهُ بِهِ كَمَثَلِي رَجُلٌ أَتَى قَوْمًا That my similitude and the similitude of that which I have been sent with is like the similitude of a man that comes to his people. فَقَالَ يَا قَوْمِ إِنِّي رَعِيتُ الْجَيْشِ بِعَيْنَيَّ وَإِنِّي أَنَا النَّذِرْ الْأُرْيَانِ فَالنَّجَاءِ He says, O oh my people, indeed I have seen an army, an army preparing to invade you, preparing to enter your lands by force, preparing to enter your homes and take captives and take possessions and kill and steal or shed blood and thus for for so on. Indeed, I have seen this with my eyes. And I am to you all a naked mourner, an expression used by the authors of that time to show the reality of what was being said. So save yourselves. I am an epic warning to you also save yourselves. The, pro- the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued, فَأَطَاعَهُ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَأَدْلَجُوا فَانْطَلَقُوا عَلَى مَحْلِهِمْ فَنَجَاءُ So a group from amongst the people, they obeyed this warner and they set out during the late night hours. And they went or exited the town or the city slowly or leisurely until they were saved. Well, kept the bet. Men whom are ikatum, for us the Hamakan, for so Bakumul Jaish, for Ahlakahum, for Shahahum. Then you had another group from amongst the town of the people that denied what this individual said. And they remained in their places till the morning. And then this army, they invaded during the morning hours. And they destroyed the city or the, and, and, the, and its inhabitants. فَذَلِكَ مَثَلُ مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي وَاتَّبَعَ مَا جِئْتُ بِهِ So this similitude is a similitude of the one who obeys me and he follows that which I have come with. The idea of guidance, of light, of that which will be the means of success in this life and the next. That is the likeness of, the, of this individual. 
ومثل من ومثل من أصاني وكذب بالحق وكذب بما جئت به من الحق. And it is also the example of those who disobey me and deny that which I have been sent with of the truth. Deny that which I have been sent with of the truth. So this Quran is being referred to, and that which is contained therein, it is the means to success for the one that takes it and follows it the way that Allah Ta'ala intends. For this reason, I felt it appropriate to, uh, this evening to take a look at a particular verse from the verses found in this particular book due to that which is contained therein of an abundance of benefit. And it is the verse in Surah Yusuf, verse 108. Verse 108. Where Allah Ta'ala, He says, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي and the rule of Allah على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني والسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين. Say, this is my way. This is my path. I call to Allah to bear wa ta'ala upon basira or knowledge me and those that follow me. And glory was subhanallah and glorified is Allah. And indeed I am not from amongst the polytheists. I am not from amongst those that set up partners in worship with Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala. The first part of this verse is a statement called Hadihi Sabili. Say, this is my way, this is my path. Qul, this is without a doubt a verbal command. And it is being directed to a singular individual. The one to whom which this command is being directed to is none other than our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's an indication that whatever comes after that is of great importance. That Allah Ta'ala will command the Messenger وسلم, to say this to the people. That what is coming thereafter is of great importance. That we as Muslims should pay close attention to. In this particular verse, the command is to say, Hadihi Sabili. Hadihi Sabili. This is my way, this is my path. The path of the Prophet ﷺ, its importance, its significance, is seen throughout the text of the Qur'an and the Sunnah for those that contemplate over the verses that are contained in another book. I'd like to quote just uh, two to three verses in order to highlight the importance of that. We have the statement of Allah Ta'ala that we find in Surah Al-Furqan. And I know that there are some taking notes. So it's Surah Al-Furqan verses 56 and 57. Where Allah Ta'ala to 
وما ارسلناك الا مبشرا الا مبشرا ونذيرا كل ما اسالكم عليه من اجر الا من شاء ان يتقيد الى ربه سبيلا and we have not sent you except as a giver of glad tidings and a warner say again another command to the people i do not ask you as it relates to this particular call for any type of wage any type of monetary gain least whoever wills takes a, a, a way or adopts a way or a path that leads to his Lord. That this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is making his call, that, that an individual takes or adopts a way that will lead to his Lord. And Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala says, Inna hadihi tadhiratun faman shaba taqada ila rabbihi sabila. He says, indeed, this is a reminder. So whoever wills, let him take a way or a path that will lead to his Lord. And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الرُّوحُ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ صَفًا لَا يَتَكَلَّمُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَانِ وَقَالَ الصَّوَابَ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمُ الْحَقِّ فَمَنْ شَاءَ اتَّقَذَا إِلَى رَبِّهِ مَآبًا The day that the ruh and the angels will be in ranks, no individual will talk on that day except he whom Ar-Rahman gives the authority to speak. No one will talk on that day. That day is the day in which man will be recompensed for that which he has put forth in his life. That day, no one will be allowed to speak except he to whom which Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala gives the authority to speak. This will be a serious day. Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala continues, that, day, that is the day of truth. So whomever wills, let him take a path that leads to his Lord. That leads to him, yani, being in good standing with his Lord. This path that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala commanded the Messenger to say, Kul hadihi sabili, this is my path. This is the path that for the individual that wants and hopes to be successful with Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala on this tremendous day, and this is the path that is binding upon him to adopt and traverse upon. And this is what is intended by a sunnah. As the sunnah What is intended here, because the term sunnah, depending on what science within the various sciences of Islam, the meaning could change. But when we look at and speak about the sunnah in a general sense, the sunnah of Mustafa, follow the sunnah of Mustafa or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then what is intended by that is at tariqah allati kana alayha it is the path in which the Prophet traversed upon. Traversed upon. This is what is intended by the Sunnah. And again, it is this path that will lead, if adopted, will lead to or lead the individual who adopts it to get to be in a good standing with his Lord when he meets him. We have an authentic narration of Skhilaq by Imam al-Bukhari. 
or Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi in his Sahih. Upon the authority of Abu Huraira or Ridwan Allah Ta'ala Alayhi, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, in Kullu Ummati, Yadkhunun al Jannah illa man aba. The all of my nation will enter paradise except those that refuse. Except those that refuse. The companions who were present who heard the Messenger وسلم, make that statement, they asked, Who are those that refuse? Who are those that refuse? The Prophet وسلم, he responded, Man aqa'ani, دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ أَصَانِي فَقَدْ أَبَاهِ Whoever obeys me, he enters paradise. And he used the past tense verb. He used the past tense verb. Now we know nobody has entered paradise as of yet, except the martyrs. But it's understood that he used the past tense verb. Why? Because for the individual that adopts the way of the Messenger وسلم, it is a guarantee that he went into paradise. It is as if he, it has already happened. It is as if it has already happened. Whoever obeys me has entered paradise. Whoever disobeys me has refused. He has refused. This and many other textual evidence shows that the path that a person adopts that would lead to paradise, that would lead to the being in this standing with Allah Ta'ala, ta it is none other than the path of Muhammad ibn Abdullah from the tribe of the Quraysh who lived over 1400 years ago, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the various different paths that exist, that are found today in, in a society, in this society and other than that, these are paths that will lead to ruin and destruction for the individual that chooses to adopt it and gives preference to it over the preference of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when we're looking at or, or contemplating on you know, that which was previously stated, and it should be understood that the path of the Prophet, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is nothing more than revelation that has been revealed to humanity from Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala clearly states this fact and elucidates it in his noble book. We have a statement of Allah in Surah An Nisa, and maybe one of the brothers can check it, I believe it's verse 113, where Allah says, وَأَنزَلُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُمْ تَعْلَمُ وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَدِيمًا That we have revealed to you, you meaning the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the book and the wisdom, the book and the wisdom. And we have taught you that which you did not know. Is it 113? Okay, Surah so An-Nisa, verse 113. And indeed, our favor upon you was tremendous. In this particular verse, Allah is clearly stating that there was two things, two distinct things that He revealed to, to the Prophet Wasallam, The book and the wisdom. The book and the wisdom. The companions of Allah Ta'ala's Messenger and the scholars that follow them or traverse upon their methodology and understanding of the religion they say that al kitab huwa al Quran, that the book it is the Quran. Well, the hikmah and the wisdom it is a sunnah. It is the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is a clear proof from the Quran that the sunnah likewise is a revelation that has been revealed to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
And that is, with that said, then any individual that comes today and they say that they're, they're a Quran only Muslim and denies or abandons that which is authentically attributed to the Prophet through statement and action and clarity as it relates to the intent of the verses of Allah then this is an individual, an individual that is not upon that way that Allah is telling the Prophet وسلم, to say to the people, Kul sabili. Say, this is my way. This is an indication that he is not upon that way. And that is because that was contained in the Quran and the Sunnah. The Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, specifically. That we know that the Prophet وسلم, did not abandon mentioning a thing that brings us closer to Allah except that he informed us of it. And he, he did not abandon a thing that will lead us away from the mercy of Allah except that he prohibited us from it. But these commands and these prohibitions were revelation that was given to him from Allah to better go to Allah. For this reason, there is no example for the Muslim to look to look towards outside of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is why Allah Taala stated about him: "لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرَةِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا." That indeed in the Messenger of Allah you have the best of examples in the Messenger of Allah. Not in Clarence 13x, not in Elijah Muhammad, not in Drew Ali, not in Marcus Garvey, not in any of any other leader, uh, Buddha or Krishna. And thus forth and so on, not in any of these leaders that people venerate. But indeed you have in the Messenger of Allah the best of examples for those that hope in Allah and the last day and remember Allah abundantly. And remember Allah abundantly. This particular verse, brothers and sisters, is found in Surah al ahzab verse, verse 21. And I encourage the brothers and the sisters to go home and get whatever tafsir that they have, Ibn Kathir, or Tabari, or, or Qurtubi, or Badawi, and whoever else, Fatul Qadir of Imam Shawkani, go back and research this particular verse. And the best of examples that we have is the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is as it relates to the portion of this verse, Kul Hadhi Sabili. The verse continues, Ed'u ilallah, I call to Allah, Ed'u ilallah. When looking at this particular portion of the verse, it includes two important things. It includes two important things. The first thing, the importance of inviting others to the way of Allah. The importance of inviting others to the way of Allah. And the lack of being negligent therein. That's the first thing. Two, it points to al-ikhlas which is normally translated as sincerity, but we'll see what the class means in a moment. As it relates to da'wah, or inviting others to the way of Allah, when I say inviting others to the way of Allah, I'm referring to da'wah. Then at da'wah, for those that are writing, <laughs> the da'wah is of two types. That was of two types. 
at Dawa at Tetsis, being the first type, at Dawa at Tetsis, the second type, at Dawa at Tejdeed, at Dawa at Tejdeed. The first type at Dawa at Tetsis, what is intended by this is the Muslims calling or inviting non Muslims to Al Islam. To Al Islam. Yani calling non Muslims to salvation, to success, and thus forth and so on. At Dawah at Tejdeed, that what is intended by this is that it is the adherence of the Sunnah from amongst the Muslims, calling or inviting the Muslims that have felt negligent in that regard, either back to the Sunnah or to clarity of the Sunnah, meaning, in layman's terms, to practicing Islam the way that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala intends. The true adherence to the Sunnah, inviting the Muslim that may be affected by some ideology or some methodology that conflicts with the revelation that has been revealed from above the seven heavens, inviting them to practice Islam the way that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala intends. Now the purpose of Dawah, <clears throat> without a doubt, is to extract, <laughs> is to extract the uh, individual from the various paths of darkness. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, He states, هُوَ الَّذِي يُنَزِّلُ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ آيَاتٍ بَيِّنَاتٍ لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُمْ لَرَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمِ He states, it is He who has revealed to His servant clear signs, yani or verses, so that, or in order, that they be removed from the various paths of darknesses to the one light. And indeed Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, as it relates to you all, was kind and merciful. Indeed Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, as it relates to you all, was kind and merciful. Was kind and merciful. This mercy that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala bestowed upon us in this regard is that He distinguished the paths of darkness from the, the path that, that is considered to be light. He made a distinguishment between disbelief and faith. He made a, dis a distinguishment between truth and falsehood. He made a distinguishment between knowledge and ignorance. He made a clear distinction between paradise and the hellfire. And the hellfire. For this reason, it is upon humanity to make a decision. To make a, de a decision, the most important decision in their life in which ways, in which they weigh their salvation or their wretchedness. They can't be forced to make this decision. On the contrary, they have to willfully comply or willfully deny. And that is because the paths that the Prophet, that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala is referring to have been made clear. For this reason, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, He says, لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله 
فقد استمسك بال فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى لن يصال لها. There is no compulsion in religion. What is intended by no compulsion in religion is that you cannot compel or, or coerce or force an individual to accept Islam. You can't come to a person and say, be Muslim now or off with your head. Or off with your head. And then that person says, it's, it's, uh, I, I accept Islam. And under this circumstance, it's supposed to be accepted by Allah? No. No, this is not the case. There is no compulsion in religion. You cannot be forced to accept Islam. Why? Allah gives us the understanding thereafter. He says, indeed, guidance has been made clear from misguidance. This shows what? That if an individual, he accepts, he accepts upon clarity and is saved upon clarity. And if he denies, he denies upon clarity and is destroyed upon clarity. He himself has, to, a person at some point in their life has to make this, this choice. This choice for salvation or this choice for destruction and ruin. And then he continues, whoever disbelieves in false deities and believes in Allah, then he has grasped the most trustworthy of handholds that would never break. That would never break. When looking at this, this important point, what time is he show again? When looking at this important point, then we see or know or come to understand the status of the caller to Allah, the one that invites to the worship of Allah. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, He says, Woman ahsanu qawla mimman da'a ila Allah wa amila salihan and who is more better in statement than he that invites to Allah and does righteous good deeds and he says undoubtedly I am from amongst those that willfully submit yani I am from amongst the Muslims I am from amongst the Muslims the condition of the caller to Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala is likewise a reality that is seen throughout the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. We have an authentic narration as collected by both Imam al Bukhari and Imam Muslim fi Sahihain, and it is upon the authority of Sahal ibn Ibn Sa'd al Sa'idi. With the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said it, the ru'tiyanna hadhihi raya ghadan rajulan yaftahu allahu ala yadayhi yuhibbu allaha wa rasoolahu wa yuhibbuhu allahu wa rasoolahu wa rasoolahu He said it that indeed I will give this banner tomorrow to one who to a man to whom which by him of his hands Allah will cause victory to come. This man he loves Allah and his messenger and Allah and his messenger love him. It's a long narration but the skip towards the end the man was Ali ibn, uh, ibn Abi Talib and he was given a banner as they were going to go into a war expedition. Ali ibn Abi Talib when he was given the banner, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Should I fight them until they become like us? Meaning, until they become Muslims. The Prophet said, he stated to him, Go to them upon, without haste, until you reach the brinks of the edges of their territory. 
تم مجعوهم تم مجعوهم إلى الإسلام then invite them to Islam call them to Islam make clear to them the path of Al-Islam وأخبرهم بما يجب عليهم يعني من حق الله فيه and inform them as it relates to what is made obligatory or binding upon them from the right of Allah to baraka wa ta'ala for wallahi li'an yahdiya li'an yahdiya Allah bika rajulan wahidan khayrun laka and khayrun laka min an yakuna laka humrun na'am or kama qala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, if Allah, if he uh, the Prophet didn't swear us by Allah, if you or if Allah was to guide just one man by your hands, one from amongst them, by way of you, by way of you, then that would be better for you than the finest of camels. The red camel at that time was considered from amongst the finest of camels. It would be equivalent to saying, I, I'm not into cars, the most expensive car you could think of. I'm not really into cars like that to really even know. Uh, I know there's cars more expensive than Jaguars. Mm -hmm. But for instance, if a person were to say, if you do this, then this would be more better for you than this Jaguar. And if there's a more expensive car, then a work this Rolls Royce. All right, for instance. If you were to if Allah was a guy by by way of you, one individual, one individual willfully makes the choice to enter into Islam that will be better for you than that. Imam al Nawawi rahmatullahi ta'ala alay. He commented on the, sta uh, on, the, on the statement of the Messenger وسلم, he, he stated, He was referring to the red camel. He stated that this was the most valued of their wealth at that time. So Allah, the, the, uh, the Prophet وسلم, gave this similitude as it pertains to the most valued of things. وَأَنَّهُ لَيْسَ هُنَاكَ أَعْضَمُ مِنْهُ And there was nothing that was considered more tremendous than it, than this particular object. With that said, though, the most tremendous of possessions at, at that time was not more valuable than guiding an individual to Al-Islam. Then guiding an individual to Al Islam. We benefit from the statement of the Prophet. We, how we benefit from this statement is that we understand the importance and the significance of inviting others to Al Islam. Of inviting others to Al Islam. This is seen in another statement of Allah, of the Messenger وسلم, when he says, "Man dalla ala khayr, falahu mithlu ajri fa'alihi." That whoever calls to good, then for him is the reward, the like of the one that enacts that good. Whoever invites an individual to good, in, in, in layman's terms, whoever invites another to good that he gets the reward of the one that does that good. Meaning the like of the reward of the one that does that good. Meaning the one who does the good, he gets his reward. But likewise, because you called him to that good that he did, then Allah likewise gives you the like of that reward as well. So this shows the importance of calling to good, inviting others to Al Islam. Inviting others to Al Islam. So that's the first part of this particular statement. Ad'u ilallah. I call or I invite to Allah. The second part is Al Ikhlas fit da'awah. 
الخاص في الدعوة. As Allah states, ادعو إلى الله. I call or invite to Allah. Not I call or invite to myself. Or I call or invite to my group. Or I call and invite to my business. Or I call and invite to my organization. Or I call and invite to my leader. Or I call and invite to my ethnicity. The superiority of my ethnicity. No. The call is to Allah, to the worship of Allah. The individual has to be sincere in that regard. He has to be sincere in that regard. There must be al ikhlas Al-Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih, Al-Uthaymeen, or Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alay, he states in his monumentous explanation of the three fundamental principles by the Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab Al-Tamimi al Najdi, or Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alay, the definition of al ikhlas the Islamic technical definition, uh, as a point of benefit, words in the Arabic language could take. Notice I said could take. I did not say use, uh, uh, do take. But could take one of three meanings. First, an Islamic technical meaning. Second, a linguistic meaning. Third, a meaning that is considered rafi a cultural, a customary meaning. So this word al-ikhlas is no different. And the definition that Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al uthaymeen is going to present, this definition is considered an Islamic technical definition. An Islamic technical definition. So the Sheikh, he says, al-ikhlas huwa al-tumqiyya. The ikhlas, it is purification. There's a pure, there's a, uh, a, a purity process that's taking place, a cleansing. Wal muradu bihi, wal muradu bi dhalika an al mar'a la yan la yabtaghi bi ibadatihi illa wajh Allah, wal wusul ila da karamatihi. What is intended by this purification, this cleansing, is a purification or a cleansing of the heart. Right? So what is intended by that is that a man, an individual, he does not desire by way of his acts of worship anything or anyone except Allah. Anyone or anything except Allah and what? And the reward, that being the entering of paradise. The receiving the felicities and the bounties that Allah Ta'ala has waiting for those that, that sincerely worship Him in accordance with His commands. So what is intended by al ikhlas it is purifying the heart from the filth and blemishes that will cause one's action to be rejected. And that is cleansing the intent. As the intent of the heart has two distinct categories, and this is very important. Two distinct categories. Niyatun muta'allaqatun bil ibadah. The first category, it is that which is directly, the, 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 the part of the intent that is directly connected to the act of worship that an individual is doing. And this portion of one's intent, it distinguishes one act of worship from another. A person could do two, two different individuals can perform two raka'a. One intends by it to hear to the masjid, another one intends by it a sunnah from one of the salat. It distinguishes between two acts of worship. It distinguishes between an obligatory action and a voluntary action. 
and thus forth and so on. That is the part of the intent, the portion of the intent that's connected to the act of worship. The second part of the intent, niyatun, muta'alliqatun bil ma'abud. The portion of the intent that's directly connected to the one that is being worshipped. The part of the intent that's directly connected to the one that's being worshipped. And for us, this is the affair of al-ikhlas. Because the one that is being worshipped for the Muslim should be none other than Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. For this reason, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said in the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, and this particular narration is is muttafaqun alay. He says, "Inna ma la'amal bin niyat, wa inna ma li kulli muri imma nawa." The actions, meaning their validity. Their validity, them being accepted. All actions are only by intent. And every man will get that which he has intended. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَكَانَتْ هِجْرَتَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So whoever's hijrah is to Allah and His Messenger, then his hijrah is for Allah and His Messenger. وَكَانَ الْهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى الدُّنْيَا يُسِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَا يَنْقِهُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا كَانَ إِلَى فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ But whoever's hijrah hijra is for the obtaining of some aspect of this worldly life, some monetary gain, or something to this effect, or a woman in order to marry, And his hijrah is for whatever he migrated for. His hijrah is for whatever he migrated for. This shows everybody Allah that a key component or a prerequisite for the acceptance of deeds with Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala is a pure intent. An intent that is free from that which would ruin it. And there are many examples of this throughout the text of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. But we want to continue. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ These are some of the benefits that are derived from that particular portion of the verse. عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ Upon knowledge. Upon knowledge. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Calling to Allah upon knowledge, me and those that follow me. As the verse states, me and those that follow me. As Allah Ta'ala commanded the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say to the people. So Basira, as, we have, as I have already stated, what is intended by, by Basira here is knowledge. What is intended is knowledge. But what is intended by knowledge? A Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih, can you guys hear me? Yes. A Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin, or Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he states, Al il ma'rifatu shay bi dalilihi. It is having an, an awareness of a thing by way of its evidence. By way of its evidence. He likewise stated in his book Al Usul Min Alm al Usul Hu Idraku Shay Alema Hua Alehi Idrak and Jaziman that it is to comprehend a thing upon its true reality with an unwavering comprehension. Meaning a person has certainty that this is the way of this affair. This is the way of this affair. And it is incumbent for whoever calls to Allah, regardless if it is at dawah at tajdeed or at dawah at ta'asis, 
لَأَبُدَّ مِنِ الْعِلْ It is incumbent upon this individual to possess knowledge and understanding. And in fact, it is as Allah commanded the Messenger ﷺ to say, عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي I call to Allah, invite to Allah upon knowledge, me and those that follow me. Because during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was not an individual that he sent in order to give da'wah, except that they were people that had some type of knowledge and understanding. But knowledge and understanding of what? They had one, knowledge and understanding of that which they were calling to. They were not people that were ignorant of the religion of Allah. And then two, a knowledge or understanding of the general condition of the people that they were calling. In order for their da'wah to be effective. This is seen in a narration that is upon the authority of Ibn Abbas. And it's likewise collected by, or it's collected by Imam Muslim and his Sahih, or both Bukhari and Muslim, but this expression is from Muslim. Ibn Abbas, he stated, أَنَّ مُعَاذْ قَالْ بَعَثَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَقَالْ Ibn Abbas, he stated that Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he stated that the Messenger of Allah, he sent me, and when he sent me, he said, what is intended here is that Mu'adh was sent to Yemen to invite the Yemenis to Al-Islam. <coughs> and when he was sent, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him some instructions. He said, إِنَّكَ تَأْتِي إِلَى قَوْمٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ فَدِعُوهُمْ إِلَى شَحَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدُ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ فَأَعْلَمُهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهِ إِفْطَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةٍ He said that indeed you are coming to a nation from amongst the people of the book. So call them to the testimony that there is no deity worthy of worship and truth except Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. In another chain of transmission, he stated, let the first thing you invite them to be the testimony that there is no deity worthy of worship and truth except Allah. Then he continues, only if they obey, uh, and if they obey you in that, Meaning this condition has to be here, there. If they obey you in that, then inform them that Allah has made binding upon them five salawat to be carried out throughout the day. But you can't get to that point unless that first part is first met. And this narration is well known to all of us. There's no need to quote it from beginning to end. What is important is that the Prophet Sallallahu first sent Mu'adh, someone who was considered to be learned from amongst the companions. That's the first thing. The second is that the Prophet Sallallahu made him aware of what type of people he was coming to in order for his da'wah to be effective. As it is ridiculous for a Muslim to go to a Jehovah's Witness and invite a Jehovah's Witness to Islam using arguments that he would use with a Mormon. Or using arguments that he would use with a Hebrew Israelite. Or using arguments that he would use with a five percenter. These people are upon different ideologies. Your dawah would not be effective if you're not aware of the person to whom which you're talking to. And that's very important. So then you go to a Jehovah's Witness and you say, listen man, the doctrine of the Trinity is false. And he responds, I agree. Because I don't believe in the Trinity. And you start coming with more points to debunk the Trinity, I agree. You haven't done anything. 
We haven't done anything. So knowledge is very important. Knowledge of the condition of the person, along with knowledge of which, what it is you're calling to. And ignorance of the legislation of Al Islam, ignorance is a sickness, especially for people that are involved in Dawah. It is a sickness that plagues the Muslims. And for this reason, this is why we don't find people coming into Islam in droves like they were during the time of the Prophet and the companions. Because when it comes to, for, for many of us, when it comes to the basic fundamentals of our religion, we're ignorant. And when some Islamophobe comes to debunk Islam, we're unable to deal with the most basic of doubts that they throw. The most basic of doubts that they throw. Speaking in, about the religion or speaking concerning the religion of Allah based off ignorance is a grave and tremendous sin. Thus we encourage the people, the brothers and the sisters to seek knowledge. Knowledge of the affairs of the usul of this religion. The affairs of Tawheed, the affairs of Iman, and thus forth and so on. Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala and emphasize him, because I like to emphasize this point. This is my closing argument, so to speak. This will be my conclusion. In Surah Al A'raf, verse 33, Allah says, Say, My Lord has only prohibited immorality. The hidden of it and the apparent. What, it, uh, what is intended by immorality here is as zina, lewd sexual behavior, illegal sexual intercourse, and thus forth and so on. Zina, regardless if you're married or single. Yani, sexual relations outside of marriage or outside of that which your right hand possesses. Alright? So, Allah refers to it as a fahisha, that it is in, he has prohibited immorality, immorality, the hidden and the apparent of it. Well, ithma wal baghiya bi ghayr al haq, and sinfulness and transgression without due right. When tushriku billah ma lam yunazil bihi sultanan. And to associate a partner and worship with Allah, that which Allah did not send uh, send a, down a, a, an authority for. When taqulu Allah ma la ta'lamun, and to say about Allah that which you know not, to say about Allah that which you know not. The scholars of Islam, past and present, they mention an important point. They state that Allah in his verse started off with that which was the least dangerous action and ended with the most gravest and dangerous action. Pay attention to that. That the last sin that was mentioned was the greatest and gravest of sins that were mentioned in this verse. Now, the last sin that was mentioned was not shirk. It was not polytheism. The last sin that was mentioned was speaking about Allah that which you know not. So how is this worse than shirk or polytheism? One of the scholars of Al-Islam, one of the great scholars today, Sheikh Rabi ibn Hadi al-Madkhali, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, he said that every calamity is in speaking about Allah without knowledge. Every calamity is contained in their name. It's not the statement, Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala is the third of three, a statement about Allah without knowledge. It's not the statement, Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala has a begotten son. A statement 
<coughs> about Allah without knowledge. It's not what the Shiite do or say when they attribute things to Allah and to his deen that conflict and contradict the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. Is this not speaking about Allah without knowledge? And thus forth and so on. So every calamity is found in speaking about Allah without knowledge. <laughs> and in closing, I want, I want to give an example of the, the severe ramifications that are produced by speaking about Allah without knowledge. And I've chosen an example because I believe that every single individual in this room will understand this example due to us being Americans and knowing and understanding American history. And being in a uh, uh, so-called Judeo-Christian society. In the Bible, there is a story that for the Muslims, it is impossible for us to affirm this to be the truth. As it relates to Noah, or Nuh alayhi salam. There's a verse in the Bible, I wrote it, uh, Genesis 9, 20 to 27. This story pertains to Noah, and I'm going to paraphrase. One day Noah was drunk, drunk and heavily intoxicated. I mean, so intoxicated from this particular story that he was found naked, passed out in his garden. This is how drunk he was. We don't even have people that we find in the streets here in America that drunk where they're slumped over somewhere in the corner or in the alley in the nude. But the claim is that Noah, this was his situation, his condition. His son Ham stumbles upon him and finds his father in the state. And instead of covering his father, he goes against his brothers. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these names right. Shin and Japheth. I think, yeah, no, how could that, all right? He, he goes and gets his brothers and basically he's like, look, look at daddy. Look at daddy's over in the garden. Look at him. The brothers, when they come, instead of gazing at the father in that condition, they turn their backs to him. And they walk with a cloth or a robe and they cover their father while he's in the state of shame. When the story alleges that when Nuh regains consciousness and is informed about what has taken place, he supplicates or invokes Allah that Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala not curse him, but curse the lineage or the progeny, the, the descendants of Ham, the children of Ham, and that they be made the slaves of their brothers. Right? Now, Christians of European descent two or four hundred years ago claimed that the descendants of Ham were the Africans. And they used that to justify the transatlantic slave trade and the various different horrors that took place. We know that 10.5 million Africans were transported from Africa to the Americas. And they say about 10 to 15 percent died uh, on, on that road from, from West Africa to the Americas. And that's around two to three million that, that died in what they call the Middle Passage. Then those that made it to the Americas and eventually to North America went through the trials that we read about in history, but the watered down stuff in the schools 
And if you do more research, you'll find even more horrifying things that occurred to uh, black slaves here in America. When we, uh, an example, uh, like the man that they call the father of gynecology, James Marion Sims, and the torture that he committed to black slave women in the name of gynecology. And other than that, from the horrendous things all the way down to Jim Crow and on, on down to institutionalized racism that we find today. All of this, all of this was produced initially by a lie that was a by a lie on a, on a lie. This particular story, this particular story, the story of this alleged story of Noah, this lie that somebody invented upon a lie. Now, why do we say that this is a lie? One, Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala, He says, That no bearer of a burden, yani a sin, shall bear the burden of a, or the sin of another. It is impossible that Allah will help, hold accountable a group of people for something that an ancestor of theirs did or committed for some sin that they committed a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, four thousand years ago, and thus forth and so on. This is not from justice. And we know that Allah Ta'ala is the most just. So to say that Allah accepted this invocation and now place a group of people in a state of wretchedness that didn't commit the sin. Is this not a statement about Allah without knowledge? Indeed it is. Then this is a lie upon Nuh alayhi salam. The NBA wa Rusul with the best of humanity. Allah wa ta'ala is not going to entrust his revelation to a drunkard. I know brothers that I pray with that are better examples than that which was mentioned in this story. <coughs> and none of us are prophets and messengers. Nuh was considered from the, from the prophets and messengers to have firm resolve upon the truth. Firm resolve. So to say that Allah would give his revelation to a man of this example that we find in this story, is this not a lie upon or a statement upon the law without knowledge? Without a doubt, yeah, we by the law. If I, 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 at the moment, I cannot think of a better example of how speaking of, about a law without knowledge has severe ramifications. Has severe ramifications. And so for this reason, yet we got a lot in closing, that one, we, may, we, should, we need to make sure that when we are inviting to Allah, that we are inviting to Allah based off knowledge. And when we speak, we speak based off knowledge. And when our knowledge stops, our speech stops. Our speech stops. هذا يكفي سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك وفي وسيلك استغفرك وبالله التوفيق